The moderator for today's panel, Lewis Akers, is a trade unionist from Dunfermline, Scotland, in Fife. He has been a trade union representative since the age of 17. And last year, he won the British Trade Union Congress's Young Trade Unionist of the Year Award for his organizing of call center workers. Lewis is also the chair of the Contour Editorial Board. Lewis, please take it away. Lovely. Thank you very much for that, Adrian. And uh, thanks very much for your uh, smashing attempt at uh, pronouncing where I'm from in uh, Scotland. Uh, you've done quite a good job for an American. Um, that's absolutely perfect. So as Adrian says, we're going to have um, three panellists tonight, uh, a lovely little bit of time, 40, 50 minutes at the end for a QA. and um, a And then uh, we'll finish off uh, roughly uh, in about, about an hour and a half or so. Um, so just to briefly introduce each of the panellists before we kick off, um, we have uh, this evening Kat Boyd, um, who is a Glasgow-based writer, campaigner and trade unionist. Um, she's an assistant editor at Connor, so I have the privilege of working alongside her quite a lot. And she's the co-host of a really fantastic podcast called Connorcast. Um, she mainly writes on Scottish and American politics, culture and work. Uh, and I know she'll do a sterling job tonight. Um, we have uh, Daniel Chavez, um, who is um, a Knowledge Hub researcher at the Transnational Institute. Um, after the defeat of left governments in Latin America, following the 2008 economic crisis and the disappointments in the European left projects, he initiated the New Politics Project at TNI to stimulate innovative thinking on questions of participatory democracy, progressive governance, um, a scholar activist um, with a strong commitment to progressive Latin America. Daniel cut his teeth as an activist at the United Federation of Mutual Aid Housing Cooperatives in Uruguay, where he worked for almost a decade. Um, he's an author and editor of several books, um, including uh, The Left in the City, Progressive and Participatory Local Government in Latin America, um, and uh, a couple of books in Spanish, um, The New Latin American Left, Utopia Reborn, and uh, a book which I can't pronounce because my Spanish is rubbish, um, but I'm sure Daniel will let us know how you pronounce that. So we're very, very lucky to have him on the panel as well. Um, and to introduce the VEC last, but very much not least, um, he's a professor of sociology at uh, New York University um, and is the author of The Class Matrix, a fantastic new book some of you might have read. Connor have been engaging in that in a reading group recently, um, Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital and Locked in Place, uh, State Building and Late Industrialization in India, which won the Barrington Moore Junior Prize. Um, he's also an editor of Catalyst, um, the journal, um, and has contributed to many other journals, including the Socialist Register, the American Journal of Sociology, the Boston Review, and the New Left Review. So it's absolutely fantastic to have such a well-equipped uh, and intelligent panel here to tackle such an important question. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Havens Right Centre uh, for uh, putting this event on. Um, I just wanted to start briefly introducing um well myself first of all um I have as Lewis said I'm a trade unionist um but you know I mean really what does that mean I've been involved in various roles and aspects um in the trade union movement since 2008 when I uh, got a job as a as a civil servant um working in the, the department for working pensions now you know like we're not talking bowler hat civil service here. We're talking like, you know, low grade office work admin. Um, and I joined the, the union and got involved in the trade union movement there. I've also worked as a trade union organizer um, with Unite the Union. And I'm currently a full-time member of staff um, at this the, the Union for Civil Servants, where I, I started as a, a rank and file activist. And I don't think that this makes my insights particularly unique, but I think it does give me a, a bit of perspective on the different aspects of trade union or working class organisation that I want to touch upon today, um, particularly because I think that the situation in the UK, whilst it is peculiar in many respects, I think we are able to draw some lessons from that. 
Um, I want to use the lessons from the UK to talk about some what I would think are general strategic dilemmas for working class politics and offer what I hope might be some provocative thoughts um, on traditional socialist thinking on topics like the trade union movement um, or labour movement, as you might say, um, and things like the, the rank and file and bureaucracy. And I specifically wanted to address this question of organisation because I do believe that the working class has one major strategic advantage and that is numbers. It's sheer numbers. That is the strategic advantage of the working class. And um, so the question of organisation is absolutely crucial. So going back to, to what's happening or what's happened in Britain, particularly over the last eight to nine months. Um, you know, naturally, I really want to stress the inspiring examples and the bits of hope that have come out of the UK labour movement in that time. But that said, sometimes, you know, I find myself getting really caught up in uh, the romance um, of the movement when it's at a peak I would and I want my contribution here to just be like really honest and um, and sober and thoughtful um because I think that there's there's no point in like you know retelling inspiring anecdotes or you know giving you the inspiring case studies um or telling you the, the stories of you know like the walkouts that you know I've been part of organizing or any of that because a lot of that, I think, can disguise the greater structural barriers, um, you know, that are products of our changing capitalist system, especially in the private sector, but also these barriers that are I ideological products of how we've embedded defeats into our psychology of collective action. I mean, sometimes, don't get me wrong, we need the inspirational stories um, but I also believe that we need a sober and honest inventory of where we are at. So I want to talk about both our strengths and weaknesses. Now, I think that's also quite a difficult thing to do. And it does make me feel kind of exposed. I don't often like talking about the weaknesses of the organised working class, um, especially at a point in time like this in Britain where we you know, are seeing an upturn in industrial action and, you know, post-COVID increase in membership. But I think that we have to look at both sides of this picture in order to really, you know, think about how we how we move forward. So firstly, let me focus on those strengths. So specifically in Britain, as I said, in the past year, strike action has increased to levels not seen since, you know, the 1980s. And we've lifted this mood of decline and stagnation that's hung over the trade union movement for a long time. And I was involved in the the last big surge um, in industrial action um, in the UK in 2011, um, the, the pension strike in 2011, November 30th. And, you know, I have plenty of inspiring, inspiring anecdotes from that day. Um, but the, the failure of that um, was a really major psychological defeat for many people within the movement um, and it's only recently in the last year that I think that we've begun to see something lifting so um, but it's <laughs> these strikes that are happening you know it's not just about the numbers of them that are happening it's just as importantly there's also a qualitative shift underway We've overcome the regression of trade unionism into like a neoliberal service provision and recent actions have proved what lots of people have argued for a long time, that trade unions recruit when they take major strike action um, and that they decline when they retreat from confrontation um, into a more consumerist relationship. Join us if you want to get your free will your free and free um what is the other thing that's uh, like uh, glasses opticians appointments you know what I mean these kind of service provider things you know we've seen like a real shift away from that and let me also mention here the biggest and newest strength of the the trade unions is that their mass popularity has grown with their propensity to militancy in this period in this latest period 
Um, I think that that's something quite new. In earlier times, well, most would concede that the effectiveness of British trade unions was it was a real thing. They had power. They were, let's say, not always well loved. And by contrast, trade union trade unionism nowadays has gained a lot of legitimacy at a political and ideological level, with many regarding union leaders as the quote-unquote real opposition to the Conservative government. And a further surprise is that the most effective communicators, whether it's in meeting halls or on television, are some of the most traditional working-class militants, like the Conleyite socialist leadership of the Real Workers Union, the RMT, people like Mick Lynch and Eddie Dempsey, whose contribution to the recent wave of action I don't think can be underestimated um, in terms of how they set the debate and set the agenda in public. Decades of attempting the millennial shiny takeover of, or makeover rather of the working class of working class politics or of the trade union movement therefore seemed to me you know fairly ill-conceived the strikes have shown an appetite however superficial for what is a relatively traditional style of socialist militancy and for me that's a that's a welcome development but this is where I want to be honest about some of the weaknesses as well so at the start of this latest period of, of action, there was definitely green shoots, you know, a flurry of strikes and protests in some non-established workplaces without long traditions of unionisation. And don't get me wrong, that hasn't entirely gone away. But nonetheless, much of the impetus continues to come from the long established sectors like railway workers, postal workers, university lecturers, and in the case of my own civil servants and that's not always a problem and I am not moralizing on this but it is a problem in practice I think that we should be honest about that because we've known for decades that these sectors are too industrially weak to carry the whole working class on their shoulders that major strategic advantage I was talking about that the whole working class cannot be carried on the shoulders of these groups of workers who are largely in and around the public sector. And that's even true in the case of some of the, the best and you know most interesting green shoots like the Royal College of Nursing. We are ultimately, as a movement, still struggling to lay a glove on private capital. And the institutional weaknesses, I think, are being in part reflected in practice. So even where we have excellent union leadership and some industrial muscle, um, there is still a general trend um, to settle below the rate of inflation. Now, some workers like university staff, for example, might be forced to settle far below that rate, right? I think that, you know, within unions, there will be um, factional debates, there will be d brutal discussions about, you know, what this means and industrial conservatism. And I'm not going to moralise on this. I'm, and to be honest with you, I wouldn't necessarily call it a defeat, given the circumstances and where people start negotiating from. Like, I think that a lot of deals that are going to be won will at least be a score draw. Um, but we have to understand that there's a fairly weak position within union leaderships where they cannot ask workers to stay out indefinitely at great cost during the periods of rising inflation when the margins of victory are getting tighter and tighter. So no matter their politics, they are bound to represent members' interests in the narrow sense of, of that term. And this raises another problem, which is that the greatest successes of the unions have been in raising wider consciousness in the field of political and ideological leadership. Mick Lynch, Eddie Dempsey, these people most especially, right? But that in itself is, is in a way a reflection of weakness because trade union leaders are, are what we are um, no matter the intentions or politics of these leaders 
trade union leaders are not a substitute for autonomous working class and socialist politics. And this is not a moralistic point. I'm not moralizing about this. I'm just pointing out that they they can't be the substitute for autonomous working class and socialist politics precisely because they are bound to a narrow definition of member interests and member democracy. And at times we have to play ball to bargain for better terms. And the wider political struggle cannot be wholly dependent on the ups and downs of union momentum. I think that is a serious strategic weakness if we start to go down that route. Because during the defeats of things like Corbynism and the, the Scottish independence campaign of 2014, much of the British left, I think, has been acting like trade unionism. And in some cases, a vague type of community activism can be a substitute for political and ideological autonomy. So what's essentially happened is that the main political campaign in front, um, let me give you an example, around the cost of living in British politics, has been an organisation called Enough is Enough, and it is essentially led by elements of the trade union bureaucracy. Now, this is not, again, I'm not moralising, this is not a personal criticism of anyone who's involved in that, but what has happened is predictable. The campaign took off with a popular profile around the RMT strikes in particular, the CWU strikes and so on, as popular stand-ins for the emptiness that had been left by Corbynism. But because union leaders now must dedicate their time to leading strikes, um, the political arm has essentially receded into the background and all but disappeared for everyday purposes. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm really getting at here is some of the busy, biggest successes of trade unionism disguise the wider weaknesses and failings of an autonomous left. And this impacts on our capacity to solve these disputes and fight for better conditions. So, for instance, when I said that some unions can claim victories despite settling below inflation, how could that even be possible? Well, we know why. There's rampant inflation driven partly by the pandemic um, and its aftermath, but also by geopolitics and warfare. We can't, ex you know, generally speaking, we can't expect union leaders to take the lead in campaigning against what is popular war fever. It's not their job. In, in fairness, some union leaders um, have actually taken a really hard political position on this. And I think that they deserve a lot of respect for doing that. And um, a lot of union leaders like Dempsey, for example, have taken a hard political position compared to some of the left wing commentary at in Britain. But it should be the other way around. Like traditionally, we've always thought of it as the other way around. The socialist left would traditionally be seen as like agitating at the bureaucrats on the political issues. Instead, it's almost become the opposite in Britain. Um, a lot of like the bureaucracy have more political backbone and what passes for leftism, particularly around um, media, social media, the commentary um, and so on seems to flop. Aimlessly. So this leads me to consider a, a final provocation. How do we as socialists relate to institutional trade unionism? Now, I've presented my view that capacity building in the trade union movement alone is not a substitute for politics. Others are welcome to disagree or say that I've built a straw man but I'm going to be quite explicit in presenting my view that too much of the post-Corbyn left have seen relentless hyperactivism as a substitute for developing coherent political positions. But there's another established perspective to consider, and that's the traditional socialist dichotomy of the trade union bureaucracy versus the rank and file. Now, there's a number of um, weak positions on this that need to be um, dispense with. Um, at one extreme, there's the this kind of traditional view that bureaucrats hold back struggle, that they suppress workers' progressive in instincts that exist to the left of the bureaucracy. Now, anyone familiar with trade unionism today, that whilst there are the occasional exceptions, 
this stereotype is generally nonsense. At best, it applied sometime in the 70s. Nowadays, I think it's quite unhelpful and misleading. You know, I think of um, the like a lot of the views that diverge between union leaderships and their members are actually the opposite way around. I think of unions pouring energies and efforts into mobilising for strike ballots where they have to get over 50% now due to the anti-trade union laws and just how difficult that has become, you know, how the disconnect has happened between the bureaucracy and the rank and file, and in some cases, and in quite a lot of unions, and um, particularly unions like like maybe the UCU, um, maybe other unions, maybe my own union to an extent, where the leadership is often on certain positions much further to the left than a lot of the ordinary membership. And um, so I think that that position of it's the bureaucracy that turns the tap on and off is, is a fairly unhelpful one. But at the other extreme, there are also, you know, um, which I'm sure people would accuse me of being, trendy trade union bureaucrats are also full-time activists. And these are these are people that I've come across who imagine that the problem of the bureaucracy has kind of vanished because full-time trade union officials are no longer, what's the phrase, like the pale, male and stale, right? They're no longer, they no longer look like that. I mean, I had a... Um, uh, someone come round from Ipsos Mori to do some some polling um, and they knocked on the door and I, I let them in and they asked me some questions and, and what I did for a living and I said that was a trade union official um, and you know the woman took a double take because no, I wasn't a, a, an older man and she was like I can't remember the last time that I interviewed a, a trade union official but they didn't look like you but I think there's a problem with that Right, because there's a group of, I think, bureaucrats who see that as progress in itself, and it's not. Just because full-time officials are no longer white male conservative dinosaurs are old, or at least some of the dinosaurs are nearing extinction, there's you know no point in dwelling on the internal organizational structures, and there's no point in looking at the sociology of unions. You know, we'll continue to fight the the last of the dinosaurs as we usher in this brave new world of trade union leftiness and trade union girl bosses where bureaucrats live amongst the rank and file as equals. I don't like, I don't subscribe to that. I think that these are two extreme positions that are, that are both unhelpful. I think that we need a more intelligent conversation about the limits and pressures on trade union leaders and bureaucracies. And it can't be a conversation about left versus right certainly in cultural terms, or good and bad. Um, instead, I think that we need a critical conversation in the proper sense. We need to establish the limits of what working class organisation can and cannot do when it comes to the trade union movement. In terms of what it can do, there are people like Jay McAlevey in the US, who has opened a really crucial discussion about the positive role that union full-timers can play. Everyone who wants to see a revival in working class organizing capacity should familiarize themselves with some of her insights. Um, but I think there are also things that union bureaucracies, as I've said, cannot do. And we have to be willing to discuss the fact that these bureaucracies exist necessarily in capitalist society under certain constraints without the misleading element of moral judgment or bad faith arguments. Yes, some bureaucracies are moving to the left. Often they're to the left of members on various issues, industrial, political, cultural, but that can also highlight the risk that union activism and union leadership are becoming subcultural rather than expressions of wider class consciousness. Subcultural leftism is no guarantee against sellouts. The worst union capitulation in the UK right now is potentially in the, the, the university union, which is led by, you know, my own millennial generation. And let me risk one final provocation. <sighs> Will I? Yeah, let's go for it. Simply by bringing... Trotsky's activists together and calling it rank and file networks isn't always the answer either. And that is not to disparage the work of people who are involved in that. 
Um, but too often, I think the organized, the already existing organized left can become dependent on precisely the wider weaknesses of trade unionism. It's far too easy to win union elections from a small and marginal base, given how low the turnouts are. Look at any British trade union election, the internal election results, the amount of people who vote in these is very, very small. So we therefore lack incentives to address the wider problems of democracy, and we can too easily become embroiled in a purposeless drift into what I would call the, the lay bureaucracy. The answer for me is to set and discuss and be open about the limits of trade unionism and what it can achieve. That we don't see it as a substitute for left-wing and socialist political autonomy, that we don't see it as an easy way to get, you know, my leftist motions passed, no matter how important I might think they are. And I don't moralize or have unrealistic expectations of, the, of trade union leaderships to substitute for our own feelings as socialists. Instead, I want us to have ambitions for trade unions in terms of what they should be, mechanisms of working class self-defense and self-organization under the straightened constraints of declining capitalism. And yes, as the far left, naturally, I want to have great incentives to contribute to rebuilding that process. But ultimately, I don't want to hide behind that. Capitalism is manifestly failing at a system-wide level and there are morbid symptoms everywhere and I think that we need the courage and the backbone to speak autonomously and collectively and as socialists and we need to do this as well analytically as Marxists as well. So I'm going to leave all those provocations there hanging for the Q&A section and um, thank you for, for inviting me again. Thanks very much, Kat. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, everybody scribble down all the provocations Kat made there so you can uh, come back with your thoughts, questions, queries at the Q&A session. Um, we're going to move swiftly on um, and I'm going to bring Daniel in, who's our next speaker. Thank you, Luis. Before I start, I think it's important to clarify the place from which I will approach the subject of the panel. I have been dealing with this type of issues for a while as a researcher at the Transnational Institute, TNI, a research center based in the Netherlands. But I will not be talking today about class, labor, or war from a purely academic or research perspective. And that's because I consider myself a worker. I was born into a working class family. I grew up in a workers driven housing cooperative. And I've been a member of a trade union since I graduated from university in Uruguay more than three decades ago. I should, oh, <clears throat> sorry. I should also clarify that since uh, time is short, I'm going to focus on the region I know best, Latin America. I will share some thought about some challenges for the working class in a region that remains locked in a peripheral status in the global uh, economy. And I assume all of you are well-informed and well-read uh, people. So I will not bore you with details about the current economic, political, and social economic background of the uh, region. And my input will be very concrete, grounded, and focusing on two main ideas. The first one refers to profound transformation in the meaning and nature of work as a consequence of new forms of production and distribution of goods and services especially significant since the 1970s as the result of a new pattern of neoliberal accumulation based on the predominance of financial capital and globalization and driven by new communication and information technologies. The second idea assumes that these challenges have also modified social perception and values around work and employment with strong impacts on the regulation of labor relations and, and social welfare. I am referring to changes that interrupted the process of formalization of employment associated with the processes of industrialization of the 20th century, and which highlighted the structural disorganization of the labor market in the region and the precariousness of work and employment with the consequent social and economic marginalization of millions of people. And it's not easy to talk today about the working class in Latin America. Latin America is a very heterogeneous region with quite diverse uh, national background. 
For example, if we look at the rate of union penetration, we can see very different situation. At the level of the region as a whole, the rate of union, 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 unionization, sorry, English is not my language, is around 10%. But there are very different realities resulting from the very different political and economic and social history of each country. Uruguay, my home country, as well as Argentina, have relatively high union membership rates of around 30%. Then we have countries such as Chile and Brazil with union membership rates close to 20%. But in most countries of the Andean and Central American subregion, the level of union penetration rate is very low, generally below 10%. And obviously, if we talk about the working class, we shouldn't focus exclusively on trade unions. But neither can we ignore the crucial importance of this particular type of organization. And today, Latin American trade unions face many obstacles, ranging from anti-union measures promoted by business chamber and right-wing governments, the neoliberal ideology that promotes individualism or regressive changes in labor legislation. But as uh, Kat was talking about, we must also acknowledge the bureaucratization of many local and national unions and the certain gap between the leadership and the rank and file of the unions, which should not be underestimated. The national economies of the region have undergone profound and accelerated process of deindustrialization, as I mentioned before, in parallel to a new offensive of capital that demands the radical flexibilization of labor relations. We must also consider the continuity of authoritarianism and political violence, including situations such as the dirty war in Colombia that included the assassination of more than 5,000 trade union activists, killing that uh, type of killings that continue today, even after the signing of the peace agreement with the FARC. And as in other regions of the world, Latin American workers suffer from the increasing informality of employment. This tendency relates to the expansion of new technologies that radically change the relationship between capital and labor, weakening trade union organization and leading to the ever exploitation of millions of workers. But obviously it's not only about technology. There are many other social, political and economic factors that we don't have time to go uh, in depth. And in the last uh, two decades, Latin America has gone through several economic and social crises, as you all know, which have deeply weakened the organizational capacities of workers. In Colombia, a country I already mentioned before, for example, workers employing the so-called informal sector number around 16 million, and they face many difficulties to emerge as an organized sector. Several small unions have been created across the country, and they have converged in the creation of the Unión General de Trabajadores de la Economía Informal which in English would be something like the National Union of Informal Workers. But uh, this union of street vendors and other informal economy workers has less than 100,000 members out of a universe, a universe of 16 million workers across the country. Faced with this new reality, unions in the region are revising their political agendas and practices. In Uruguay, for instance, the PITCNT, the National Trade Union Congress, has developed a strategy specifically aimed at strengthening the organization of unemployed and informal workers. And the new economic, political, and social reality of the region has also highlighted the need to strengthen bridges between workers' organization and other social movements. One of the most interesting examples, again, can be seen in Colombia, where in the context of the very serious social crisis exacerbated by the pandemic, a whole new wave of social mobilization has emerged. I guess many of you will remember the images on the news of the impressive street mobilization in Cali, Bogota, and other Colombian cities in the context of the Paro Nacional, the national strike uh, in English of 2021. And the three major trade unions confederation of, of, of the country, the CGT, the CTC, and the CUT, were actively involved in the planning and implementation of the Paro Nacional, but they were not the main organizer of the national strike and the whole range of mobilization that happened around that time. In addition to the trade unions, the Paro Nacional was organized by the unemployed youth, the indigenous peoples, peasants, and other social collectives that are not represented by the trade union movement. 
these kinds of tensions between trade unions and other social organizations have also been very strong in Argentina in 2001, in Brazil in 2013, in Chile in 2019, and in other countries in the region that had major social uprising in recent years. In the few minutes that I have left, I want to mention some challenges for the organization and political strategies of the working class in the region. I want to make it clear that I'm not going to be entirely original, as much of what I'm going to say is based on a very interesting exchange with trade unionists from all over the region, especially in the framework of a recent seminar organized by the Continental Network Trade Union Confederation of the Americas, TUCA, in Brasilia last February. The meeting was attended not only by trade unionists, but also by social researchers such as Marilane Teixeira from Brazil, who had been working on this type of issues and, highlight, and who highlighted eight major challenges. The first challenge is analytical and presupposes that the transformations underway in the region mean a new reconfiguration of the working class. It's clear that capitalism always seeks to resignify its forms of labor exploitation under the argument that flexibility is a condition for generating employment, that, company, that companies and trade unions need to adapt to a new globalized economy, that people prefer self-employment, and that the best option for any worker would be becoming an entrepreneur. A second challenge is how to articulate labor rights with the fight against all historical forms of exclusion and discrimination based on gender and or race or other uh, differences. These forms of oppression are anchored in the structure of capitalist society, so they cannot be neglected or treated as purely identity struggles, as some unions did in the past, as they are deeply intertwined with much broader social demands and social struggles. This challenge means rethinking the forms of insertion in the labor market in which all people should be included equally, regardless of their origin and rage, sexual orientation, age, or ability or disability. In other words, inclusion should not be seen as an exception, but as part of the construction of a more inclusive society in all its dimensions. This is a quite rather obvious uh, challenge, but the third challenge refers to the defense of economic and social rights and welfare, which are essential if we are not going to allow further degradation of living condition and further weakening of public institution. We must be able to formulate alternative social protection policies for all people with a more universal scope and, the, and independently of the formal legal status or employment situation of each person and unions have not been that good uh, addressing this kind of uh, challenge. In the previous stages of the evolution of capitalism, the social gains achieved by the most organized workers were extended to other less organized uh, working people, enable the construction of an extended system of rights and welfare. But in the current uh, context of working class fragmentation, it's necessary to rethink the system of social rights and social protection as universal policies, regardless of the link to employment. In other words, collective bargaining remains important, but today is clearly insufficient for the defense or extension of the rights and welfare of the working class. A working class that has been reconfigured is heterogeneous and geographically dispersed. This implies the need to think of a more horizontal and inclusive type of workers' organization that learns from the previous organization of unions, but goes uh, beyond uh, that model. Trade union action needs to be connected to the demands and struggles of local communities around access to public policies and services, such as health, education, housing, transport, telecommunications, etc. A fourth challenge is to strengthen public institutions responsible for the regulation of labor relations, confronting the current offensive of capital, to liberalize the condition of hiring and remunerating workers, and addressing the potential worsening of working conditions. A uh, fifth challenge is to understand and address the impacts of technological innovation on the meaning and value of work. Recent academic debates and media coverage around the world has addressed the 
apparent significance of artificial intelligence and, and tools such as a uh, chat a uh, GPT on the creation or elimination of jobs. Uh, but this is a process that began uh, several years ago. It is crucial to guarantee work for all people and that jobs are recognized as socially relevant and not restricted to the circuit of capitalist accumulation. In other words, more than in previous stages of capitalism, it will be up to the state to guarantee the right to work while ensuring that work is articulated with new patterns of production and consumption that ensure environmental sustainability and are oriented towards collective uh, well-being. Uh, this uh, fifth uh, challenge yeah, also implies revisiting the old question of economic and social development. I'm very interested in the debate on the growth in Europe and North America, but the reality in Latin America and other regions of the South is quite different. It is necessary to rethink the model of development beyond extractivism and productivism hegemonic in the region, but ensuring the generation of jobs and the reduction of inequalities. It's crucial to change the current pattern of growth in Latin America and reverse the trends that limits the countries of the region to the role of mere exporters of commodities and raw uh, material. The challenge uh, number six is directly linked to the previous two and involves responding to the demands and prospects of young people, particularly those on the urban peripheries affected by ever increase in unemployment, informality and underemployment. In virtually all countries in the region, access to higher levels of education doesn't necessarily mean better social prospects. Neoliberal technocrats insist on the need to adjust educational plans to the demands of the market, and the left reaffirmed access to quality education as a democratic right and as a condition of citizenship. But today, the exclusion of young people in Latin America can no longer be explained as a consequence of a supposed educational deficit. In Brazil, to, uh, to cite uh, just uh, one example, 38% of young black women with higher education work in activities that require at most only elementary education. And 40% of young people graduating from Brazilian universities do not find an occupation compatible with their academic uh, qualification. The seventh challenge is to articulate the idea of a universal basic income with the creation of jobs that meet social needs and contribute to the well being of local communities with reduced working hours and respect for labor rights and social welfare. In other words, the challenge is to generate decent jobs that contribute to solving social and environmental uh, problems. The eighth and final challenge in this basic list is to bring back to the center of the political debate, the reduction of working time. Technological advances may shorter working hours technically possible, even in regions in, in the South, such as uh, Latin America, and has always been the case in the history of capitalism. The issue is political and ideological rather than uh, economic. Advocacy for shorter working hours could be linked to the broader debate on the distribution of time between work and other human activities and the sharing of domestic responsibilities between men and women. This challenge also implies reversing the current trends toward structural job insecurity. It is therefore vital to agree on demands, proposals, and strategies that reflect not only the demands of trade unions, but of the many and diverse social forces fighting for social transformation. I think I made it in less than 20 minutes. So yeah, I stop here. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Daniel. That was absolutely fantastic. It was a really brilliant and comprehensive overview of the situation from where you're standing. It was great to see a crossover of some of the themes which Kat covered as well in her talk. Um, last, but definitely a lot least before we move on to the Q&A, uh, we have Vivek. Oh, thank you, uh, Lewis, and everyone who um, is here today. I, I'm, these, I, these are famous last words, I know, but I, I'm going to try to keep this short because um, I think we only have about uh, less than an hour for questions and answers. Uh, I will, I think I'm expected to say something about the American situation 
Uh, and that's what I'm going to focus on. And like Kat, I'm going to talk about the what is certainly undoubtedly an advance that the left has made and that the incipient tiny trade union struggles, the revitalization of the struggle is making, but how um, it is still encumbered by pretty profound uh, difficulties and disadvantages, which really are have to be soberly addressed by the left if it's going to move forward at all. The, the most important structuring fact about the current moment, of course, is that what you might call the, the Bernie Sanders moment, the Bernie Sanders uh, uh, sort of a revitalization is largely over. From 2016 to 2019, 2020, it was a pretty heady time for the left because in the, for the first time in it, probably two generations, concerns that are really central to working class life and to the vast majority of Americans occupied center stage. We hadn't seen this in the public culture and political discourse in decades. And what was a felt to be a marginal, quite powerless set of ideas and social forces, which is the ideas associated with social democracy and with socialism, uh, became wildly popular. And this had this wasn't just a cultural change. You saw real political gains. The Democratic Party developed and now has a fairly visible progressive caucus within it, which actually pushes for genuinely progressive policies. And you also saw an uptick in union organizing that kind of, um, in terms of sheer number of elections that are taking place for union recognition, dwarfs anything we've seen in the past six or eight years. And not surprisingly, Biden himself was forced to shift his administration's policy agenda further towards a welfare, social democratic, even industrial policy perspective, which you hadn't seen a a Democratic president do, probably since Johnson. These are all very positive things. The difficulty is that much of that momentum has been lost now. And the shift towards a centrist approach on the part of the Democratic Party and a quite, uh, I think, aggressive attack from the right uh, is now very visible. So while there's a, I think you might call a residue of all the gains that came from the Bernie moment, uh, they are receding, and they need to. We need to figure out how to shore them up if we're going to continue to gain, to build on the gains of the past three to four years. Now, I'm going to focus on the union movement here because whatever else happens, unless trade unions and union organizing progresses, nothing much is going to be uh, gained. We've seen that in Biden. The left has been strong enough, and progressive Democrats have been strong enough to put a quite ambitious set of policies and a, an agenda on the table. But if you follow the progression from the initial drafts of the Build Back Better Act to the final legislation, which was the IRA, most of the pro-working class progressive elements, redistributive elements were taken out. And what was left is a kind of employer-heavy and empl uh, employer-biased set of industrial policies and subsidies and economic policies. What that shows is that without real pressure from organized labor, from working people, the left can dream, but it can't really accomplish much. Without actual organizing of the American workforce in the private sector, which stands at around, I think, 6% now, it's very hard to imagine how any kind of gains are going to be made. Well, that said, if we return to what's going on in the, the labor movement, you have seen an actual, what appears to be a revitalization of union organizing. Um, the, as I said, the number of union elections in the, just the first half of 2022 and extending into 2023 was more than twice what it was the year before. Problem is it masks something that is pretty important for us if we're gonna, as we go forward, which is that when the elections that have been won have largely been in sectors where either employers commit to neutrality or which are very small and don't have much of an impact on overall union density. So even while the uh, filings for union recognition have increased 
the proportion of the working class in the union uh, organized unions continues to go down. That's the outcome of organizing in places like museums or cafes. The number of units is large, but the, the number of workers in each unit is still very, very small. Why is this happening? It's happening because of the most sobering fact there is about the landscape of trade unionism in the United States today, which is that the legislative, the legal environment is probably the most hostile anywhere in the advanced world. So the, what the data seems to show is that in instances where unions go into sectors and firms where employers are hostile to having a union, and who fight against it, the win rate is tiny. It's something around 10%. That means nine out of 10 times when unions try to organize in the face of employer resistance, they lose. So the result is over the past 15, 20 years, unions have shifted their focus primarily to sectors where their base is either already semi-organized, like graduate students, the UAW organizing graduate students, or where employers de declare neutrality places like museums, uh, places like art galleries. And that's where the increases uh, are, where you've, uh, uh, increases in union organization are occurring. The problem is that A, these workers have very little leverage. These are not the sectors that you wanna have a union presence in if you actually want to move the needle, if you actually wanna move things. Um, and B, uh, the strike activities, the strikes that do occur are overwhelmingly in units that have unions. So expecting workers in the auto industry or in, uh, uh, in logistics, in transportation, uh, in warehousing, who are not organized to spontaneously threaten strikes is just not realistic. That accounts for probably less than a quarter of the strike activity in the country. So it brings the ball back to the difficulty that if we're going to see an actual revitalization of a socialist element of radical working class politics. There's no choice but to pour resources into those very sectors where employers seem to be the strongest and where they have been the most successful in resisting the expansion of organizing. How can this possibly happen? And we're basically stuck in a chicken and egg problem. The, the only, there are one of two things or both things that are required. One obvious one is to change the legal environment, which uh, structures organizing efforts, the law under the NLRB. Of course, this is what Obama had promised when he was elected. And he had not only the presidency, but he had both chambers of Congress and he reneged. He pushed it off the table himself, probably out of a survival instinct, but almost certainly because of his own ideological predilections. Biden is making noises about it, but there's been no effort whatsoever to move towards what is the favored strategy, uh, legislation of the trade unions, understandably, which is going from the current rules of electing, uh, of uh, voting for unions to a card check procedure. Card checks, wherever we've seen them have had enormous success in allowing workers to join unions, but it just doesn't seem like it's on the cards. Okay, so if it's not going to be through a clear uh, shift in the legislative environment, what else can we sit, uh, where else can we pin our hopes? That in forging the kind of pressure from a working class activity that would either give leverage to a progressive democratic caucus that's trying to push for this or would pressure them to do it even if they're not especially keen to do it. And here you land back again to the dilemma that where the unions have tried to organize in the private sector, in the where it's the parts of it where they'd have real leverage and real power, the employers have always been victorious. That's the chicken and egg. You're gonna need the pressure to change the legislation, but without some changes in legislation, it's hard for unions to succeed in the face of the most powerful and the most well-endowed and the most savvy capital class that we have in the world today. Uh, in moments like this, the left tends to pin its hope in uh, small changes that are occurring. It is, I think, important that the UAW has had a election recently where a rank and file movement has won and which is declaring a commitment to pouring serious resources 
into organizing. It is important that even within the Teamsters, there's a strike possibly coming up, which could activate uh, the membership. And these are the two of the most three or four important unions there are in the country. That is a possible, a possible way out. But I should say, um, for those of you who've been around for a while, since the 80s, the left keeps pinning its hope on this or that rank and file movement, this or that union that might finally start pouring resources into organizing, finally start taking real risks. But as Kat has said, they don't do this. And the reason they haven't done it in the past is not just because they're union bureaucrats and bureaucrats sell out, et cetera. It's because it is an extremely daunting prospect for them to take these sorts of risks. So we're, we end up pinning our hopes on these movements who are ideologically motivated and who would be willing in the face of great odds to incur the costs of moving forward against the employers. Those costs can be borne by the trade unions. They are swimming in money right now. They just have to start devoting more of it to organizing rather than the, the lobbying and the, funneling of, the funding of elections, et cetera, which they've been doing, which really have not had much success. So my takeaway from this is that I don't think the left is going to advance in a molecular fashion, one union at a time, one rank and file caucus and victory at a time, uh, because it, after 40 years of it, the verdict that that thing is in, which it, that the left advances in large leaps, of course, buoyed by and dependent on the work that's going on day to day, union by union. Uh, firm by firm, but you're up against a series of structural pressures, which have been, uh, I think, solidified by an institutional environment that makes this molecular strategy very hard to achieve. So, in my view, the strategic dilemma is then the following, which we have to, I think, end with. The left will move forward, the working class movement will move forward through big leaps, not through incremental change union by union. I think there's going to be one of two avenues to these big leaps. One is another moment like the Bernie moment or what Corbyn unleashed in uh, Great Britain that will be based or structured around elections. Because elections in a profoundly depoliticized culture like the United States, presidential elections are the one moment when political debates, political conversations capture the public imagination. And that's what Sanders was able to capitalize on. So that's one possibility. The difficulty here is this. There is no Sanders waiting in the wings anymore. Sanders himself is now a spent force. He's not going to run again. And even if he did run again, it wouldn't be effective. Um, he's lost steam and he's lost some credibility uh, after hitching himself to the Biden bandwagon the way he has. Within progressive Democrats, there is nobody else who can capture the moment the way Sanders did. And the reason is simple. Either they are themselves encumbered by uh, a, a, a insufficiently strong commitment to working class politics, or, and maybe this is the same way of saying this, this, uh, what I just said, or they are, what Sanders' brilliance was, was he, he was able to vault over what is called the culture wars. He was able to, instead of taking a side in the language wars and the, the campus wars and the race wars, he was able to appeal directly to working class voters and members of the working class, regardless of their political affiliation, regardless of their race and their gender, all the other members of the progressive Democrats tend to get caught up in these things. And they're too easily associated with the college crowd and with a kind of liberal elite culture, which means that they will be unable to capture large sections of the working class, especially the white working class. And it's sad to have to say this to the left, but there is no way forward without the white working class. And unless the left stop demonizing it, it's dead in the water. And this is this, the fact that it still continues to wag its finger at it, to, to lecture at it, shows just how much it's captured by the college crowd, as opposed to an organically connected 
working class leadership. So first of all, I think the chances of a Ro Khanna or a uh, AOC or a Cori Bush actually making inroads is infinitesimally small. I don't even think they'd make it to the primaries. Well, the second uh, possibility is through some kind of legal changes in labor law that would uh, accelerate the process of class organizing. Now, we've seen just under Biden, just having one or two friendly judges on the NLRB had a huge effect on the success in the Amazon uh, uh, elections and as well as the Starbucks and Trader Joe elections. It had an effect. Imagine what it might do if you had more far-reaching and more sweeping changes in the law. I think it'd be quite dramatic. Uh, again, how would we ever bring that about? This is the dilemma. I, I don't know, because as I said, these are the, le the legal changes on which American capital puts all of its muscle in blocking it. And without the antecedent working class movement, I do not know where you're going to get the muscle, the leverage to make these changes. The dilemma is that it's going to, I think, have to come through one of these avenues, either a continuation of a national political electoral campaign, which creates the environment the way Sanders did to make, give labor the confidence to move forward and not just feel like they're a special interest and isolated in the general culture, or through a removal of some of the obstacles, which would make it more enticing and less forbidding for the union movement to pour resources into taking on employers where they're the strongest, rather than confining themselves to organizing baristas, grad students, and museum workers. Those are all good victories for propaganda. Those are all good victories for spreading the idea of unions and the culture, but they are not a means for changing the balance of class power in this country. I think we're stuck here. And Bhaskar Sankara and Jacobin had a very good term for it. it. It's purgatory. We have become strong enough to propose real changes, but we're nowhere near strong enough to actually bring those changes about. I do not, in capitalism, you can't tread water for very long. Uh, either you move forward or capital pushes you back and pushes you down. We are still lucky enough to be treading water. I don't think we can do this for much longer unless we find a way out of this impasse. I, I wish I had a solution to it. I, I wish I, I had a perspective that showed the way out. Uh, but if I did, I wouldn't be sitting here with you guys, I guess. <laughs> I'd be doing more important things. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much for that, um, Vivek. That was lovely. Um, I'm sure if you had the answer, you'd be re leading the revolution right now. Um, we can all hope for that and pray for that one day. Um, you'll all be glad to know that it's your chance to have uh, asked questions. Um, if the panelists can maybe pick one or two questions, not all of the questions to answer, um, and hopefully we'll get through three or four rounds of questions. So yeah, I'll throw the floor open to questions. Um, we've got David um, up first. Cheers. Um, David Jameson, editor of Contra.Scott. Um, three really interesting talks there. Thanks very much uh, to all three of you. Um, I wanted to ask, I, mean, I think this is maybe primarily to Vivek and Kat, um, about uh, a possible third uh, lever here. Vivek mentioned, too, the possibility of greater socialist, you know, socialist leadership in the electoral field or in the, in the organising field. Um, I sort of feel like there's a third kind of missing element here, potentially, which you might call extra parliamentary politics. Um, and I feel like some of the defeats for street level movements of recent years have put the dampers on this idea, for example, in the United States, as inspiring in many ways as Black Lives Matter was, it was perhaps, you know, it was pretty unique in modern history in both its scale and its lack of legacy in, term, in terms of tangible victories. So I think we're all living in a situation where we're quite acutely aware of the limitations of kind of extra parliamentary mass mobilization type, type street movement. But the alternative, I suppose, might be represented by what's going on in France. Uh, Frederick Laudon has a really interesting piece in the Left Review Sidecar blog where he claims that the present workers' movement in France, which is very militant, uh, and which unites trade union and street level action 
um, that the kind of parameters for that were drawn out by the Gilets Jean. So a few years ago, the Yellow Vest movement. So that's a possible, I think. I, the, the reason I raise it is I'm thinking about Vivek's final chapter in one of his recent books called The Class Matrix, where he discusses the sociological problems, as it were, of class formation today. Smaller workforces, um, workforces are less um, concentrated in the same working class communities. These things kind of representing some of the barriers towards the recreation of the type of corporate trade union movement we saw in the first half of the 20th century. Could it be that with the working class being structured in that way, kind of more inclusive workers' movements, not necessarily centred on the trade unions, but including, including workplace combination, might be a road into building a more militant and effective trade union movement? Is there a third kind of option there is what I'm, what I'm asking? Cheers. Thanks very much for that question, David. Um, we're going to bring in uh, Sarah Glynn. Uh, next. Um, yeah, um, speaking from France, so I was really glad that um, David brought that that in. And and I've just, well, we had a, another demonstration today and it's just been amazing how, yes, week after week, there have been more and more demonstrations and actions on the streets and just seeing um, the coming together of trade unionists and non-trade unionists. And in fact, the today's demonstration here in Strasbourg, um, it was noticeable that there was less of the sort of formal trade union, but very, very strong on the students and on many other people and the, and the level of involvement and anger. And of course, it's not, you know, you've got the formal um, demonstrations and then you've got the un informal ones, um, and a lot of anger and a lot of tear gas as well. But but of course the the um, the the way that um, the French police have reacted has just increased the anger. So yes, I think that is really important to to try and understand what's going on here. But the the other thing that I wanted to raise and and I think one of the things that's been exciting here is is how people on the streets, yes, it's ostensibly about pensions, but of course, everything's being brought in. And it's very much people saying, you know, this, this is about the future, climate change is part of the, of the, of the whole story. And, and we haven't really talked about that. And, and not just climate change, but the, the whole, um, the argument for degrowth, uh, the, that we need to be seeing perhaps a very different approach to to work, and to, that we're just that, that the it's destroying the planet, and um, yeah, it's it's it taking those issues much bigger, and it's something. Um, it's just seeing something like Kat mentioned, enough is enough. And it was very disappointing to see that the limits of the discussion and that, that it wasn't bringing in those bigger issues. It seemed a very limited um, 20th century discussion. So yes, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to hear people's comments, both about the issues that David raised about the, the the different sorts of protests here in France and the on-street protests, but also bringing in the environmental issues as well and the different types of, of patterns of work and life that actually that's going to mean. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. Follows on really nicely from David's question as well. Um, and we're going to take um, one from the chat as well for this round of questions. So we've got a question from Gordon Gibson. Um, which I'll read out. Um, uh, it says, how do we do it? Um, in Scotland, uh, it's straightforward, in my opinion. With the collapse of the SNP, we call for and build a unified independence movement again. What about England, not to mention the rest of the world? Um, so that's, we've got three questions. How do we do it? How do we rebuild the movement? And um, David's question on extra parliamentary politics and um, Sarah's question about the sort of environmental angle to rebuilding the working class movement. Um, so um, I will bring in Kat first, since you spoke first. Um, give Vivek a wee rest, and then we'll take Daniel and then Vivek. OK, thanks so much. Um, I mean, on David's question, um, which actually I, I think is quite different from, from Sarah's, 
Um, because I think casting my mind back to the the Gilles Jean was a really was a very peculiar characterization of the of a mass movement at the time. It was kind of the first um that we where we had seen the real mm, messiness of what it is going to take to have that third possibility that that David is referring to. Um, I remember when those stories about the Gilets Jean were breaking, you know, you would have them described as protests led by the radical light right. You would have members of the AFD trying to attach themselves to the Gilets Jean. But then you would also have them described as the protests of the radical left. You would have, you know, trade union leaders very supportive of them. Um, and undoubtedly, those protests with like groups of autonomous, self-organized people doesn't make it an autonomous, um, self-organized socialist grouping. But unless socialists are there and willing to intervene into those movements into those moments that can often seem quite ugly and um, I don't think that you know we will get anywhere so when those moments erupt I think it is the duty and responsibility of socialists to insert themselves into those situations even if there is a mm, a kind of uh, reticence about some of the views that people may hold I mean we have also seen that before and we've seen that happen um, in Greece, um, like very, like much before Syriza became any type of electoral force, when there was a real like anti-German sentiment, when there was the capitalization on a type of Greek nationalism through the occupations in the squares. They weren't they weren't specifically left wing in the way that some of us socialists might like them to th to be, you know, there was no raising of the red flag. Instead of the Greek flag, there was burning German flags. But if it hadn't been for socialists intervening into those moments, then we wouldn't have had actual infrastructure or the beginnings of, of, of infrastructure and um, beginning to be built. So I think that my view is that as socialists, we have to be interventionist into those types of moments. I also think it's similar with Scottish nationalism. I mean, if you know people here from Scotland will remember that when the referendum was first announced, it was it looked pretty boring. It was all, you know, keep the queen, keep the pound. <laughs> Man, nothing will really change and actually became the biggest anti-establishment movement that we've seen in Scotland um, for a long time and certainly characterised by a lot of left-wing and socialist ideas. So I think that this third option that David is talking about, that we have to understand that it will be messy. My personal view on these types of questions is like, I want to see a majoritarian left i'm interested in majoritarian politics um, and what i mean by that is class unity um around mostly economic questions where we can have you know this uh you know pushing of the trade unions to into these like bigger sectors, these ones that can actually lay a glove on capital. And I'm not saying that we, you know, throw out like all matters of identity politics, but I think that we need to be able to build a left that is big enough and strong enough to encompass varying views on certain social issues and that go beyond our common demands around economics. Um, in terms of the failure of enough is enough on climate, I mean, I I understand the frustrations of climate justice campaigners. And um, I would also say that the climate movement, it had ha generally speaking, they have been big demonstrations, but I think that we need to have an honest look about the class composition of those climate demonstrations. Um, because I think that there is a predominantly middle-class movement um, in the climate demonstrations, I'm not saying there's no working class people involved, don't get me wrong, but that when I made my introductory remarks, I said I wanted to be like really sober and honest about what I see happening. And one of those things is that I think it's great that there, you know, is greater awareness about climate 
I don't think that you can, you know, coherently argue for a position of degrowth um, at, at this point in time. I think the climate movement is still seen as the terrain of the middle class. Um, I think that the communities that suffered the worst of deindustrialization still have some of the worst social problems in Britain. Um, and I think that, that has to be borne in mind. Um, yeah, I'll just leave my comments there. Thank you very much for that, Carl. It was lovely. Um, Daniel, I wonder if you want to come in um, next on any thoughts. Yes, uh, there is a very interesting question from Neil from South Africa. I guess IEG is the Institute for Economic Justice about the significance of universal basic income in Latin America and how the unions are taking in or participating in this uh, conversation. I have to clarify in case it wasn't understood when I refer to it in my presentation that I'm not idealizing universal basic income. I'm not uh, totally in favor of that type of grants in every situation. So when I refer to it, I refer to it in the context of several other uh, conditions that should be in place as a challenge for the trade union. But uh, I must also say that this is not a question that has really evolved in the conversation uh, between unions or within unions in uh, Latin America. And some of the unions who had begun to process uh, this conversation are quite critical of the idea of universal uh, basic income. And I think they are quite critical for good reason, because some of them argue that this idea could be self-defeating because it could be used to rolling back the state or dismantling public service or go again other existing uh, social protection measures that would compete with UBI and so on. So many of the progressive or left people who are supporting this kind of uh, proposal do not come from the union, are not based in union. They are mainly left uh, intellectual who are developing very interesting ideas. I mean transition. I can understand why we need a UBI, and I'm very favor for it in some contexts, but not in every context, as I say. And I would like to know more about the situation in South Africa. And I'm going to Johannesburg next week, so I'm looking forward to engage uh, or, or learn from comrades in that country who are interested in this conversation. Thanks very much for that, Daniel. Hopefully you can continue that um, conversation with Neil when you're over there. Um, I understand you have to go for um, five minutes time um, and leave this uh, lecture. So a uh, massive thank you for you coming along and giving us your time this even, evening. Um, we'll finish this round of um, questions um, with the deck. And then we'll move to the next round of questions. David's question, you know, in the abstract, of course, David, um, there's never been a successful working class movement without an enormous um, extra parliamentary, by, by extra parliamentary, we mean mass mobilization component to it. And it, it, so there's no doubt that as a, you can want to call it a third pillar of rebuilding the left, it has to be absolutely central. Uh, Two provisos to that. One is that we have to see it as something that is attached to the working class movement and not a substitute for it. As to paraphrase Kat, what she said earlier, what happened in the 90s and early 2000s was a, a, a kind of a euphoria around movementism and the hyperactivism and constantly being out in the street. And it became a kind of lifestyle politics for a lot of people where you affirmed your commitment to a certain goal and ideal. And it, the pleasure was in being yourself, making yourself present and seen rather than achieving the goals. And it's it not insignificant that the, 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 the glorification of activism occurred at a, during a time of defeat after defeat after defeat of the left, those two came together. And I think the lesson you have to take away from that is that without actual class organizing, protests are basically a symbolic act. They're a symbolic act, which 
that horrible, you know, bullshit about speaking truth to power. You can speak truth to power all you want. Power doesn't give a shit. So unless you have something, some kind of muscle behind it, it's not going to go very far. And I think France is a good example. Again, such a sobering fact, folks, of all advanced capitalist countries, probably the one with the biggest, largest wave after wave of mobilization has been France, I would say since 95, since the mid 90s. And they haven't reversed a thing. They lost on everything. So while it's a very, I'd rather have that political culture than the American one, one does has to investigate. And I think it's a, it's it's so stark and significant that I think it needs to be studied. Where how is the country that brings out millions upon millions of people every three years against neoliberal policies end up with a cut uh, with a country end up being a country in which those mobilizations at best slow down the pace of the reforms, but don't reverse them. And so that's the sobering, I think, warning against this sort of stuff. So the, the takeaway is. It has to be seen as an adjunct to electoral and class mobilization and not something that's independent of it. And that brings me to this Sarah's question about environmental issues. Uh, look, I think the key to the environmental issues is environmental environmentalism is that if it's going to actually slow down the process of climate change, it's going to involve enormous challenges to capital, enormous challenges to the way in which profit making is put ahead of everything else, that's going to revolve class organizing again, and industrial policy and active labor market policy, all of which are a massive shift towards social democracy. Without a class-based movement, you can't have that. And that means you have to frame environmental issues in a way that working class people see them as consistent with their interests and not an attack on their interests. Raise it like degrowth. I mean, when you when employment, if you're in a country where employment is a major issue, the fir first thing that degrowth conjures up is joblessness, slower economy, declining standards of living. I think while the, the substance of what, you, what is proposed in a lot of degrowth literature is salvageable, the term itself is like abolitionism or defunding the police. It's disaster for the left. It shows the kind of class character of the left. To my mind, if we could do away with the term degrowth, I'd be very happy. And if we could just speak in concrete terms about putting people before profits, about job, a job growth machine of environmentalism, if we could put it that way, because as Kat said, the people who suffer most from environmental degradation are the poor. You don't have to sell them on the importance of the environment. You just have to put it in a way that doesn't look like you're attacking them and what little they have to keep their heads above water. So I think environmentalism not only can, I think it will be a central part of the working class movement when it gets going again, because if you live in East Palestine, you are literally dying because the two parties are killing you and that's an environmental issue. But if you go and tell East Palestine that we have to slow down job growth, they're not gonna come to you. Thank you very much for that, Vic. Um, we're going to bring some uh, bring Daniel in very quickly before he goes, just on David's question, and then we'll take the next round of questions. Um, so if you can, uh, you want to come back in on David's yeah, question. Uh, before addressing the question, I want to clap in relation to what the Vivek say about the growth, because that's precisely what I try to say when I refer to the difference conversation about the growth in the north and in the south. And the proposal of not using the concept is quite interesting. There are some languages I learned from comrades in the Balkans where the translation of the growth to Croatian, for instance, means something totally different uh, and that uh, helps. But in Latin America, we had been using other concepts that do not necessarily mean the same, but are quite close, and which are much easier to understand and, and to be adopted and, and included in the political agenda of social movements, such as Wemby Beat and, and many uh, other. And in relation to David's question, I think that's a crucial question, but talking from a Latin American perspective, it's a quite old question, the one of 
union, working class organization, and extra parliamentary politics. And it doesn't have to be a black and white choice. I think if we look at the history of trade unions, working class organization, and political parties in, in Latin America, we can see that in the case of Brazil, for instance, the Workers' Party is called like that for a reason. It, it has its root in union. Uh, Lula da Silva himself was a, a trade union uh, leader. In the case of Argentina, uh, Peronism has a very long and contradictory and complex uh, relationship with union, both the, the left Peronism and the right wing uh, Peronism. And it has something that it has uh, continued uh, until quite recently, until the, the government of uh, uh, Nestor Kirchner and uh, Cristina uh, Fernandez. In the case of Uruguay, the Frente Amplio, which is a political force which is much more party driven, also has a complex relationship with the union. And I think it's not by chance that the current president of the coalition is the former president of the National uh, Trade Union Congress, the PITS uh, CNT. So I think you, you can engage in extra parliamentary politics as a working class organization while also engaging in institutional politics. And I think we shouldn't dismiss the importance of political parties. We shouldn't dismiss the, the importance of trying to, to gain it into power by other means. Thank you very much for that, Daniel. Lovely. We're good. We've got about 50 minutes roughly to go. So I'm going to, there's a couple of questions we might have to miss, unfortunately. So I'm going to take a couple that are in the queue um, with their hands up. And then we've got a couple um, that are in the chat that came in um, that we'll take as well. Um, so we'll take the ones that are uh, got the hands up first, a um, couple that have got the hands up first, and then the ones in the chat. So um, DK, could you please uh, come in first and could you put your camera on as well? So we can all see your lovely face. Hi there, how are you doing? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. That's grand. Hi, hi, how you, how's, how's everybody? Just wanted to say that, uh, first of all, not a single person in this call is working class. Um, if you defend AOC, if you defend Bernie Sanders, if you defend Jeremy Corbyn, these are all imperialists and you are a grifter just like them. Um, there is working class anti-establishment movement, such as the Scottish independence movement, such as the MAGA movement in America, the Yellow Vests, of course, the economic freedom fighters in South Africa. Can I um can I come back on that, right? Because like I uh, I respect people that disagree with us, do you know what I mean? Like and um, in the first time I've been called a grifter. Um but there is actually dare I say it, we grains of truth. And some of that critique, because I watched this a lot of the left turned against the Canadian truckers, for example, when they were out on the streets defending their rights, using their collective power, using their solidarity. I watched as lots of socialists, like comrades of mine, would say, "Oh, you know, this is a right wing. This is this is awful. They're racist. They're this. They're that." And actually, this is what I mean about majoritarianism this is exactly the sort of thing i'm talking about is that just because someone's wearing like a hat that you didn't like and they're standing next to someone that you think looks a bit dodgy we as marxists have to look at that analytically and look at it as part of the big picture i don't know if our, our friend dk um is gone but you know i actually welcome honest contributions like that because i've seen it happen and I think that there are, I, I don't agree with everything that you said, right? But I do think there's grains of truth there. And I think that like people like myself, I'm not working class, right? I think we do have to look at them and we have to discuss this stuff like straight straight ahead and not duck the question. Thanks very much for uh, that. Kat, we'll um, move on to um, Hilary uh, Wainwright next before taking a couple of questions in the chat. Okay, well, I agree with Kat on that the response to the last um, contribution, and I wouldn't claim to be working class either, and therefore, you know, people like us are, need all the time to be self-aware of our situation. But I suppose what I wanted to respond to, maybe it's um, um, 
well, firstly, all the speeches were great. And I really particularly value Kat's um, explicit move away from the romance of our optimistic moments and a sort of look at the structural position that we're in and and exploring that and responding it's, it sort of links a bit to david's point maybe um and, and links to daniel and vivek as well which is really to do with the, the thing they have in common the thing they have in common is the relationship between the working class organized at the point of production and and um political parties politics and maybe it's good to address that a bit more explicitly um because we're in a sense in a in a situation of a double crisis, a kind of crisis of the old forms of political organisation, the old um, forms of, of social democracy, which I mean, you know, there was a kind of clear kind of left alternative to that crisis with, with Corbyn, but that's a moment that's gone. That, that we were defeated, though. I'd argue that some of the legacy of that still influences what's happening now in terms of the unions. Um, but um, in a way, we've seen the sort of dead end of social democratic politics and of that notion of working kind of within the state um, and, uh, you know, without any really powerful, autonomous, extra parliamentary working class power. But on the other hand, we've got a crisis to a, a working class organisation at the point of production. But what it seems that we're seeing potentially, and I don't know the resolution to this, um, so it's just really posing a question. So that in the strikes that we're seeing here, I agree with a lot of what Kat says, but I'd also add that what's striking is that these strikes, though they're very militant um, around the immediate issues of wages and so on, they're also militant around, in a way, what the Labour Party social democracy has found to do, which is defend the public sector, defend public services, defend defend the the decommodification of the market in a way, defend the sort of emergence or development of some kind of non-commodified form. So, you know, the doctors at lunchtime, for example, went to, to the picket line and they were saying this is a strike not just about our wages, but about defense of the NHS. And that's a kind of interesting dynamic because it's a move away from, or it's almost like an extension of collective bargaining. It's a move away from a purely economistic notion of um, trade unionism, which was crucial to the Labour Party. That division between politics and and industrial struggle was fundamental to the Labour Party and, and to its limits. <clears throat> and I think this now relates to... to, to um, climate change, that the kinds of developments that are most hopeful, in my experience, are those where um, I'll just about finish, an explicitly working class concern with conversions, with, with a movement, um, a labour led, working class led, um, you know, decarbonisation, as it were. So I won't go into detail of that, but it, again, an extension of collective bargaining. But what does my question, in a way, what do these dynamics mean for the form of political organisation that we should be developing? That, um, you know, I think that in and against the Labour Party or in and against the um, the Democrats have has proved, um, you know, as clearly limited. And there's now a kind of politics within the industrial movement, so within the industrial struggles that that could lead to a rethinking of, of politics and what forms could that take? And the fact that in Scotland there is a fluidity, you know, there is the possibility of a sort of shake-up of the constitutional order is, is an opportunity, maybe. I mean, again, one shouldn't be romantic at all, but I wonder what that... I mean, we can learn from Latin America, I think, too, because of the new forms that have emerged there. Um, we're going to take a couple from the chat now and then we'll pass over to the Vec and Kat just to sum up um, on the questions. Um, so we've got one from Bob as well. Um, we're asking about um, how much of left-wing thinking has come from middle-class academics or intellectuals, people who the working class do not see as one of them, the leaders from the working class and of the working class have been trade unionists in the UK and elsewhere. How do we get those two groups to start working together? And then we have a question from Katrina. Um, about the role of the party 
um, and about how broad left parties have tried to build the sort of strategic triangle between institutional politics, labor organizations, and extra parliamentary movements. The truth is that most of these have, uh, experiences have stalled or made big mistakes. So she's wondering, um, what do you think is the role of a party in resolving this dilemma? So um, I'll bring in Vivek first, um, and then Kat, if you can be quite succinct, um, as succinct as you can be with such complex questions, um, and then we'll conclude uh, for the, this evening. I'll pass back to Adrian. Oh, I'll be succinct. This encompasses also DK's concerns, I think. Um, th th there's, there's never been a working class movement which was comprised exclusively of workers. It's a movement which has different dimensions to it, one of which is fighting at the point of production. Another one is building social movements. But the third one is also a strategy and thinking at a slightly higher level of generality about where we're going and what kinds of measures we need and what kind of policies we need. Um, there will always be every single one of those examples DK mentioned about authentic working class movements have middle class and upper class elements within them. And the question is simply about what's the cart and what's the horse? Who is disciplining whom? And this goes to the question that uh, you just uh, raised, uh, Lewis, uh, from the chat room. Um, the, the working class movement has always had intellectuals, people from middle class, even bourgeois backgrounds involved in it. But when there was a movement, those intellectuals were disciplined by the movement, and they saw themselves as servants to the movement, servants in the sense of taking their cues and their culture and their moral universe from what the movement was drawing up. And the difficulty right now is that over the last 30 years, the middle class has largely declared independence from the working class movement and has started to see the movement as somehow it's a war, somehow it's the object which is going to tutor and teach and moralize at. I think a lot of what DK is saying is his, um, his, his worries are animated by that, and I, I share them, and Kat already expressed how she shares them. Um, the example of the Canadian truck drivers is terrific. I was appalled by the reaction because a lot of what they were saying was very legitimate. It was amazing to see the authoritarianism of liberal America around the issues uh, in COVID and how quickly they came down, falsified the scientific record and uh, refused to let family members visit other family members in hospitals, all these sorts of things. When they were left there to articulate and give a, some kind of expression to these concerns, where do you expect workers to go except to the right? And then you wag your finger at them and call them deplorables. That's the liberal left today. That's, that's where we're having to work with. So of course we should, our goal, is to immerse ourselves in a working class culture and help build that culture. We can't help where we were born. I was born into a certain class. What all I can do is try to use my class position to help build a culture around a class movement. Uh, and the South African freedom fighters, please, let's just, anyway. Um, the, around the party, I think this sort of answers the question of the party. I don't know what a good answer is. Hillary also raised this. I don't, none of us know what kind of political organization we need right now in addition to the working class ones, because it's a different capitalism than it was in 1920. And it's a different culture. It's a, the, the Vanguard parties, the 20s came up at a time when there was no democratic culture in, in civil society. They were fighting for democracy. They came up at a time when workers didn't even have political rights. We are now living in a political culture where democracy, civic associations, uh, dem democratic rights are the norm that's going to call for a different kind of political organization. But it, I don't think it's going to be a horizontalist movement of movements organization. I do not think you can take on capital without some kind of some kind of centralization and some kind of political training and cadres. So that's my view. But we're going to learn to practice. And so far, the practice of the last 30 years has been that the, all the experiments outside of the classical party models largely failed. And we just have to account for that, acknowledge that, and go back and look at the models that actually achieve something. To me, those are the models coming out of the Third International and Second International, which included both the Social Democratic Parties and the Communist Parties. They all come out of the same essential model of party building. I think we start from what worked, and then we see how we can modify it instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, which is what the 90s left was trying to do. I, I, I'll just keep it at that. Thank you very much for that, Vivek. I'll bring you and Kat to any final thoughts or any responses. To yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I gave um, our friend DK the example of the the Canadian truckers, but I also think the response to the um, the the war in Ukraine is another one. 
Um, I saw most of the professional, academic and managerial kind of class left um, having a very one-sided analysis over that war. Um, despite the fact that um, the US government spent $47 billion in one year um, arming Ukraine, and it has been a, a project that has um, strengthened NATO, um, and that for a long time on the left, they were they were areas of hot debate, even, even in my lifetime, <laughs> so, so not that long ago. Um, and that has kind of all collapsed then, because Vivek's right, the middle class have absolutely taken control of all of these aspects of um, the, the the elements that are needed for working class resistance, so the fight of the means of production, um, the strategy and tactics and so on. I think that the, where we need to be honest is about like where our role is within this, like, you know, people on this call, myself, I think about like, where is my role within this? And um, I'll go back to the the point about parties, maybe try and tie this in with some of the, the stuff that's been asked about, you know, a united front for Scottish independence. The problem, uh, of course, with Scottish independence is that we're now witnessing the complete um, implosion and collapse of the SNP. I don't think that people have really grasped how serious this is. And, you know, we've always known that in order to get independence, um, you would need the the, the SNP to, to be part of that process. Um, but where the SNP have gone wrong is a really good example of where a lot of the left has gone wrong. It's become overly professionalised, dominated by the professional managerial class, um, you know, it's all gestural politics. It's a lot of virtue signaling. It's a lot of saying the right things. And um, someone in the chat was talking about AOC and Assange, and you know, speaking as an abolitionist, but apart from Assange, that sort of thing. You know, this is the the professionalization of the political sphere by the PMC is is a very real thing, and it has, I think, in Scotland, ultimately damaged the the prospects of of independence. Um, and I would like to see a majoritarian. Um, realignment and a majoritarian party for independence that focused predominantly on uh, for example questions of sovereignty right so what I mean by that is questions of sovereignty is economic sovereignty that the decisions about the economy should be made by the people who live and work in that country and not by you know Westminster um, I think that we should have social sovereignty that our decisions should not be made by the European Union and we should have foreign policy sovereignty that those decisions should not be made by NATO those sorts of things are the, the kind of the elements that I'm talking about is that you would you would have as your central tenets for a majoritarian party that's based around um, class in the in the in the broadest possible sense. So um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and uh, thanks all for for coming along.